Thank you for joining us in worship. I find that people, uh, people love when they get free things, but I think that they also get mad when those benefits are also given to the people that they don't like. I want you to consider what happened when American congressmen were debating how they could reward the brave soldiers who were fighting World War II. They wanted to thank and reward these veterans, and they wanted to motivate more people to go fight. So Congress wrote the GI Bill. The GI Bill was generous. One aspect of this bill guaranteed that for a year after coming back from war, all soldiers could apply to receive $20 a week for a year. This would allow people to recover from their physical and mental trauma after the war so that they could focus on healing and reconnecting with their neighbors before having to land a job. But when told that this benefit would not just be for the white soldiers, but for all soldiers, some people got very upset. The one who was most vocal in opposition was Mississippi Congressman John Rankin. He opposed this bill, which would have benefited many of his constituents, because the thought of having black Americans receiving government funds made him furious. The bill ended up getting passed, but while the GI Bill's language did not specifically exclude African Americans, most of them ended up being denied benefits. This was because Congressman Rankin succeeded in making sure that the money and benefits would have to be given out through the state governments rather than the federal government. 80 years ago, in the 40s, it would have been laughably outrageous for a black veteran returning from war to try to enroll at the University of Mississippi. In 1944, racism was far greater than it was in 1962, and 1962 was when James Meredith became the first black student to be able to enroll at Ole Miss. As you might expect, on his first day of classes, there was very vocal opposition and federal marshals had to accompany him to ensure his safety. But did you know that there were so many protesters that the National Guard had to be called in to support, and several hundred National Guardsmen were surrounding this one student, James Meredith. But it still wasn't enough because people started throwing rocks and inciting a riot on campus. In the end, President John F. Kennedy had to mobilize the Army. In all, over 31,000, federal personnel had to get involved to make it possible for one black student to enter the University of Mississippi, and this in 1962. So in the 40s, the few black veterans who received tuition assistance, they generally had to attend historically black colleges, most of which were non-accredited, or they would have to attend vocational schools. And the vocational schools that were open to black students were not equipped to teach the more higher paying jobs like plumbing or electrical work. This was not just the case in the southern states. On Long Island, Levittown was built during this time. Many single family homes were sold to soldiers returning from the war who had access to federally subsidized mortgages. However, real estate agents refused to show any of the properties to black buyers. And even if they had applied for a mortgage, the banks would have rejected their application. In New York and northern New Jersey, fewer than 100 of the 67,000 mortgages backed by the GI Bill were supporting non-whites. The benefits of the GI Bill were not spread to all soldiers because white citizens became angry and violent when others tried to access the same benefit as them. And we see similar tendencies in the church. In the early church, in the book of Acts, we see that the early disciples of Jesus were all Jewish. But with a man named Cornelius, for the first time, it was clear that God was making the benefits of faith in Jesus available to everyone equally. And the Jewish believers were reluctant to celebrate the inclusion of the Gentiles because they believed that the Gentiles were not righteous enough to celebrate and deserve God's blessings. However, when it was made clear that these Gentiles were made clean by God, the racists in the church relented and repented, and the church chose to celebrate God's grace. Before we get into the passage that describes this, would you pray with me to prepare our hearts? Dear God, we confess that all of us are prone to racism. 
we have mocked other cultures. We have believed that our group was more deserving of your blessing than others. But as you corrected the hearts of the Christians in Jerusalem, would you touch our hearts today? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. God's word for us comes from Acts chapter 11. Uh, We'll be reading from verses 1 through 18. Soon, the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. Then Peter told them exactly what happened. I was in the town of Joppa, he said, and while I was praying, I went to a trance and saw a vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky, and it came down right next to me. When I looked inside the sheet, I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles, and birds. And I heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, I replied, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up to heaven. Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go to them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. These six brothers here accompanied me, and we soon entered the home of the man who had sent for us. He told us how an angel had appeared to him in his home and had told him, send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He will tell you and everyone in your household how you can be saved. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? When the others heard this, they stopped objecting. They began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Even before Peter gets back to Jerusalem from Cornelius' house in Caesarea, the news that he was in Caesarea gets there before him. According to verse 1, the other believers in Jerusalem are told, the Gentiles have received the word of God. Just as Congressman Rankin was offended and enraged by the thought of government benefits going to African-American veterans, the Jews were enraged at the thought of God's favor being appropriated by the Gentiles. When the Jews heard that Christians were baptizing uncircumcised Gentiles and claiming that God's Holy Spirit was dwelling in them, when they were allowing Gentiles to read the Holy Scriptures in worship and offer blessing in Yahweh's name, the Jews were angry. They were probably cursing Peter and saying, who are you to give away our spiritual blessings to the Gentiles? Why should they have any share in our spiritual inheritance? Why would you allow their uneducated minds and dirty hands to participate in the worship of our holy God? And when the church became associated with these Gentiles, many of the Jews who were previously interested in learning more about Jesus, they lost interest. It'd be like trying to convince an agnostic, who also happens to be a white supremacist, to come to your church while your church is busy helping black Americans get unemployment benefits, mortgages, and tuition repayments through the GI Bill. White supremacists would shout with rage, they don't share in the wealth of our country because we created it with the resources God gave to us. Everything you're giving away to them is something you're stealing from us. That's the way the Jews felt when Christians began to share the gospel with Gentiles. So gossip about Peter began to spread. There's this buzz that reached all the Christians in Jerusalem as people began to say things like, Peter ate with the Gentiles. I heard he was stuffing pork and other unclean things into his mouth. Peter slept in their home. I heard there was a picture honoring the Roman emperor right above the bed where he slept. 
Because these rumors are spreading, verse 2 tells us, when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. These are not Jewish Jews. These are Jewish Christians who are criticizing Peter. After getting back from his long, eventful journey, instead of being greeted with praise and thanks from the church, the church at this point, which was entirely composed of Jewish believers, they greeted Peter with suspicion. Explain yourself, Peter. Your actions are getting us mocked and persecuted by the temple leadership. Jews that we were hoping to bring in to the family of God are being turned off. We heard in verse 3, that you entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them. Why would you do that? Peter probably expected these questions, so he was ready to tell them exactly what had happened. In verse 5, he says, I was in the town of Joppa, he said, and while I was praying, I went into a trance and saw a vision. Peter is explaining, you heard that I was in Joppa. You heard what happened there, right? God used me to heal a paralyzed man named Aeneas in the name of Jesus. Even Tabitha, who was dead, came back to life. God did miracles through me in Joppa so that you could know that what happened next was all according to God's will. Peter is saying, I was just in Joppa. You heard what had happened there. I was walking with God, and God was doing great things through me. It's not like I was like, on a vacation or doing something wrong, I was walking with God. And in the midst of that, while I was praying, I had this vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky, and it came down right to me. Peter describes that vision further in verses 6 and 7. When I looked inside the sheet, I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles, and birds. And I heard a voice say, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat them. According to the Old Testament law, none of the reptiles are clean for food. This means that at least some of the animals in the sheet, perhaps all of the animals in the sheet, are unclean. But a voice is telling Peter to eat them. And Peter is telling the critics in Jerusalem, of course I didn't think I should go eat this forbidden meat. In the vision I said in verse 8, no, Lord, I replied, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. And at this point, I believe that believers are nodding with Peter thinking, if we had such a vision, that's exactly what we would have said. And Peter continues in verse 9. But the voice from heaven spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And this is where Peter's worldview begins to change. He's thinking, I know that this animal by itself is an unclean animal, but couldn't God have done something to make this unclean animal clean? Since physical fire can make raw meat safe for human consumption, couldn't God's spiritual fire make unkosher meat into something kosher? While pondering this vision, Peter had to greet three visitors who were Gentiles who came to his door. Peter testifies in verse 12, the Holy Spirit told me to go with them and to not worry that they were Gentiles. These six brothers here accompanied me, and we soon entered the home of the man who had sent for us. So Peter is saying that the Holy Spirit told him to go with that crowd to go to uh, Cornelius' house. And the Holy Spirit is making this analogy between eating unkosher meat and hanging out with Gentiles. On their own, they are unclean. But if God has made them clean, then there is no need to worry. So Peter understands what God has asked him to do, but because something new and strange is happening, Peter decides to take a group with them, six Christian brothers as traveling companions. So Peter processes this new information from the Holy Spirit as a community. And I think this is great practice. We should, whenever possible, make decisions as a group in the church. Deciding as a group purifies our motives and clarifies our perceptions and most importantly allows us to glorify God together. So even if an individual has a vision from God and has conviction this is what God wants, the decision should be made as a group, prayerfully. 
That's why attending church meetings prayerfully is an important part of church membership, and I hope you will clear out 20, 30 minutes from your schedules next week to join us after the 11.30 service. As a group, Peter and his brothers in Christ are led by the Holy Spirit to the house of Cornelius. And there, they hear Cornelius say in verse 14 that an angel told him, a man named Simon Peter will tell you how you and everyone in your household can be saved. So Peter, in recounting this story, is making absolutely clear, it wasn't my idea to bring Cornelius into the church, but the Holy Spirit brought me to meet him, and then Cornelius asked me on behalf of his entire household, how can we be saved? At this point, many who are listening are probably remembering that they too asked Peter the same question in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we are told that after witnessing the Pentecost, thousands of Jews gathered around the apostles to ask, how can we be saved? And the members of the crowd questioning Peter are all remembering their journey of faith. When they wanted to experience assurance of salvation, they were told to repent and believe in Jesus. They were told, because of Jesus, a new life is possible. Don't turn to your coping mechanisms. Bring your problems to Jesus. Instead of trying to get revenge on your own terms, bring your bitterness to Jesus. Instead of trying to work off your spiritual debts, bring your guilt to Jesus. Once they understood what it meant to have faith in Jesus, they signified that they would start a new life by getting baptized. Through baptism, they declared their faith in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and they knew that faith in Jesus had made them clean in God's sight. And believing that their hearts were now clean and a place where the Holy Spirit would be willing to dwell, they would pray and receive the Holy Spirit to fill their hearts. I shared last week that there are three conditions to receive the Holy Spirit into our hearts. You need to be connected to a Christian community to the point that others in the church are able to lay hands on you and pray for you. You also need a heart of devotion to the point in worship you can say your love songs to God and know that you mean it. And third, you need a commitment to ministry to the point you can identify, oh, this is the work that I've been called to do. When you have taken these three steps, you know that you are ready to invite the Holy Spirit to fill your heart. And taking these steps requires some time and effort. Like a landlord preparing a home for a tenant has to clean out the refrigerator, patch the wall, rewire the burned out outlets before the tenant can move in, we need to be going through these three steps, receiving prayer, lifting up worship, serving in ministry. That's the condition of the believers in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit is poured out in Pentecost. That's the situation of the believers in Acts chapter 4 when the church experiences continued revival in Jerusalem. When Paul in Ephesians tells the church, be filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul is telling Christians to do the things that qualify us to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. Getting healthy is not supposed to be a mystery. If you want to get physically fit, you've got to lift, do cardio, and stretch. If you want to get spiritually fit, maximally accessing the wisdom and power of God, you've got to receive prayer, lift up worship, and get involved in serving. The directions are clear and written in Scripture, and it's something that your spiritual mentors will tell you if you ask them. You will receive the Holy Spirit and become spiritually vibrant if you ask in obedience to Scripture. So if you are a baptized believer who understands the gospel, if you are prayed for, if you're giving worship and you're serving, over time you will experience the Holy Spirit filling you. You might have seasons of dryness that God is using to purify your heart and prepare you for a new level of intimacy, but generally this is how spiritual health works. But there is an exception to that rule, and we see it in today's passage. Before Cornelius's, before Peter even finishes presenting the gospel to Cornelius, 
And before Cornelius professes faith, before he gets baptized, before he takes part in Christian community, before he participates in worship, before he commits to any ministry, it says that Cornelius and all members of his household were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter testifies in verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Just as the Pentecost was unmistakable in the experience of the disciples, Peter says what was happening in Cornelius' house was unmistakably the Holy Spirit touching their hearts. And the odd thing is that the Holy Spirit is filling them even though they have not gone through the steps that are required to prepare a heart to receive the Holy Spirit. Reflecting on this, Peter shares in verses 16 and 17. Then I thought about the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? At this point, Peter realized by not taking the gospel to the Gentiles, not offering them a chance to believe, the Christians were standing in God's way, blocking God from doing what God wanted to do. Acts chapter 11 is possibly 10 years after Acts chapter 2. 10 years they knew the gospel. 10 years they knew that Jesus had commanded them to go to every nation and baptize people to follow him. But they were refusing to do evangelism to anyone outside the Jewish community. And so when Peter realizes this, he realized he was standing in God's way because he was only sharing the gospel with the people with whom he felt comfortable. I was preaching to youth this past Friday evening, and I am comfortable with all the youth in our church. But there were some kids who were very easy to preach to. They maintained eye contact. They were smiling. They looked like they approved of me and looked up to me. But there were also other kids sitting in this section who were not making eye contact because they were looking at their phones. And uh, they kind of made it seem as if they didn't like me. I felt far from them. Even though I'm a pretty secure 42-year-old man, I still felt a little bit rejected by these preteens in this section. And there was a temptation to ignore them and only focus on preaching to the people who were connecting with me physically, visibly. But I told myself, appearances are deceiving. And I told myself to preach to the whole group and to expect that God would be working in the whole room. And as we closed in prayer, I could sense that everyone was being spiritually open and that everyone was praying. And afterwards, when I greeted them, I could see that that section, they were friendly. Their eyes were kind towards me, and they were exhibiting curiosity about the gospel. Sisters and brothers, how many people that God intends to disciple are being neglected because we think that they don't look like worshipers? How often does our insecurity or our fear or our pride make us dismissive about the souls that God wants to save? How often are we standing in God's way? This is the question that Peter raises to the church in Jerusalem. Who are we to stand in God's way? God wants to save them. The Holy Spirit is falling on them before they even hear the gospel fully. And that is a sign that God is frustrated with us. God is so impatient with our slowness to preach the gospel to them and our slowness to disciple them that God has to skip those steps, make them clean in a mysterious way, and pour out the Holy Spirit on them. Now what should we do? The response of the church is described in verse 18. When the others heard this, they stopped objecting, and they began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. So when we see that people that we neglected are able to experience the Holy Spirit, we should praise God and also repent. We should be wondering, why was it that I thought that they would never turn to God? Obviously, I was wrong. 
God has given them the privilege of repenting and receiving eternal life. So as we see this in Scripture, what should we do next? I have seen kids who have not heard the full gospel. I have seen kids who did not even listen to one full sermon. Kids who were uncommitted. Kids who were not connected to any Christian community. Kids whose hearts were unprepared and unclean. They still received the Holy Spirit. Why? It's as if God were saying, if you're not going to preach to them and get them ready to receive me, I'm going to skip you, Sam, and I'm going to bless them and meet with them. But why does God do that? Is it so that I can just ignore them and say, well, they met God without me. They're going to be fine on their own. No. God is saying, notice that I was so frustrated that you were standing in my way that I had to skip all the pastoring that you were supposed to do for them. And now that I've seen God encounter them, I'm supposed to go pastor them. Amen? Amen. If you know that God is causing someone that you don't expect to be a Christian, to experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you're supposed to recognize, I was standing in the way of God with my preconceptions and assumptions about their disinterest, and God is telling me, to go and be Christian community to them. God wants everyone to go through the steps of cleansing their hearts so they can abide with the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of you were like that. Your youth group pastor or your pastor at some point never really believed that you could love God passionately. And one day, you were made clean by God even though you never made any effort yourself. And the Holy Spirit fell on you, and you experienced an authentic touch of the Holy Spirit. But no one taught you how to maintain a consistent connection with God. They didn't teach you how to prepare your heart to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. You experienced at least once that God intervened, suspended your spiritual responsibility, and cleansed your heart for you. What should you be doing next? Should you be waiting for the next random encounter from God? No. You should recognize that if God has met me once, even with me not preparing my heart, that is showing that God wants me to prepare my heart so I can meet him consistently. Amen? Amen. Just because you experience the Holy Spirit without having to go through the steps of cleaning doesn't mean you're supposed to never clean your heart. Let me go back to the example of the GI Bill. Through the GI Bill, more of the working poor in America moved into the middle class in the 40s and 50s than at any other time in history. But it wasn't the $20 a week that they received for a year that made that difference. That money was coupled with financial counseling and life coaching. And soldiers were taught to study for jobs that would lead to empowered lives. They were taught to buy homes and build wealth through managing mortgages. They received the tools that allowed them to accumulate wealth and pass it on. And during that time, some who served were denied all those benefits because racists claimed blacks and other minorities are not fit to receive this kind of financial investment. It will be wasted on them. It will insult the white Americans who offered it to them. In the same way, the Jews in the time of Acts claimed Gentiles are not fit to receive the spiritual investment and it insults God's chosen people to extend the word of God to them. But what has time shown? Many black families moved out of poverty when finally given access to the same help, especially when the financial investment was paired with counseling and coaching. That little bit of investment moves people of all races out of poverty. Similarly, When God chooses to freely lavish spiritual resources on the Gentiles, pouring out the Holy Spirit on people who are unprepared, it was effective as long as the church came alongside these new believers and offered the counseling and the coaching needed to learn how to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So friends, you should see that God is moving. And even when the church has not been faithful, God allows people, certain people, to experience His grace and to be touched with the Spirit. And that should be a challenge to all of us, 
to recognize there have been people that I have assumed would not be interested in discipleship. And we have to remove those filters, go to them, and offer everything that we know so they can learn how to be filled with God's Spirit on a consistent basis. Would you pray with me? I believe that this word is challenging for us to hear because most of us are not experiencing a life of being filled with the Holy Spirit ourselves. We ourselves are people who randomly kind of experience the Holy Spirit touching us. We don't make a disciplined effort to cleanse our hearts and go through the steps that allow us to receive the Holy Spirit continually and regularly according to the guidance of Scripture. Instead of cleansing our hearts and preparing, we are like the kids whose rooms are sometimes cleaned by their parents. They make no effort, but their parents are so frustrated at some point, they come and clean it up, and things are clean for a while, and they enjoy that blessing. And that's the way we are. Sometimes God is just extra generous, and he allows us, despite our lack of effort, to experience the touch of the Holy Spirit, and that is the only way we know how to experience the Holy Spirit. We don't know how to discipline ourselves to cleanse our hearts and prepare to receive the Holy Spirit as Scripture guides us. And so, when it comes to discipling people who are feeling far from the church, who have only experienced that grace once or twice, we don't know how to talk to them because we don't have the discipline of learning how to walk with God regularly ourselves. And so we celebrate that God touched that friend or that acquaintance once or twice. And we think that hopefully God will move again in their life, but we make no effort on our own to reach them. And God is saying, discipline yourself and become a Christian who knows how to receive the Holy Spirit regularly. Follow the admonition of the church leaders that say, be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that by knowing how to be consistently connected with the Holy Spirit, you might know how to react when someone experiences grace for the first time. God, we come before you admitting our immaturity, admitting our lack of preparation for ministry. But would you help us to see the cost? Would you help us to recognize we are standing in the way of your salvation being poured out on the people that we love? And would you help us to make the changes necessary so that we can be your partners and your tools so that your kingdom may expand and your glory may spread? These things we pray.